Right. So, as Gail says, I work for the Portal Antiquities Scheme, and right at the bottom of here, we have a web address. But what you can do is any of the artifacts that I've been talking about, you can actually go onto this, uh, onto our website, and actually look up these artifacts that we're uh, that I'm talking about. And there's a whole raft of various different artifacts, from coins to pieces of pottery uh, to even pieces of sword. Now, these are all things that have been found by members of the public, and that's something I'm going to be discussing in a moment, some of the artefacts that have been, have been found in the local area uh, by members of the public. And as Gail has said, it's mainly by metro Tetris, but not exclusively. We also get people such as field walkers or even people digging in their back gardens who can find some of these objects. Now, because we've only got a limited time, I'm going to actually, I've actually got a theme, and I'm going to be looking at artefacts of religion, and artifacts that have a sort of a, a bit of a magical property. And I'm going to stick to the medieval period. So I'm only, only going to look at three specific artifacts in this category. Uh, so as I say, medieval artifacts uh, that are, uh, have a religious significance or even a, a, a magical significance or a spiritual significance. So the first thing I want to do, probably the most overtly religious of these the three artifacts I'm going to look at are pilgrim badges. Um, the pilgrim badges, you'd have an, uh, uh, well, a, a massive uh, um, uh, um, uh, commercial thing in the medieval period. You'd have uh, people that would go on a pilgrimage and they'd go to a specific shrine. Uh, perhaps the, the most popular shrine in the medieval period was the shrine of uh, Thomas Beckett at Glastonbury Abbey. And you'd go on, a sh uh, you'd go on your pilgrimage uh, to, this, uh, to the shrine of, say, Thomas Beckett in, in Glastonbury. And you can actually buy one of these badges to actually show that you've been on pilgrimage this, to the abbey. And here actually is a pilgrim badge of Thomas Beckett from Glastonbury Abbey. And here you can see the actual Thomas Beckett himself. Look a bit grumpy, big, big, big frown there. Um, uh, he's got the Bishop's Mighty there and his priestly guards uh, on there. And these, these, these badges would be um, almost like a, a, like a display. Um, you, you have them on, on like a display, like a, you, to show that you've been on pilgrimage. You might, you know, so individuals will go on multiple pilgrimages as well and display multiple badges like this, like this individual just here. He's been on, uh, been on several pilgrimages to several different shrines and actually purchased badges from these various different shrines. Another badge that we do sometimes see, um, not, so, not, too clear, not so often as the badges of Thomas Beckett, but still one that's probably more pertinent to this, uh, to this period um, right now is this uh, pilgrim badge of St. Roach Hill, St. Rock. And here we have the actual saint uh, depicted here. You can see they've got the uh, the halo just behind their head. And there's a dog just down to the to the side of some, uh, some rock there. And the, the significance of this badge is that they were, uh, this, this saint was often invoked against plague, which I have to say after the past year, that's quite an appropriate badge to actually sport. Um, another badge that I have seen, and this is probably one of my most favorites, um, is this one. This is a pilgrim badge of St Albans. And here the actual legend uh, sh uh, has it that um, St Albans, which is uh, an individual at the end of the Roman period, was executed by a Roman soldier uh, who chopped off his head. But so the, uh, the Roman soldier couldn't actually see anything else after he'd, he killed St Albans. God actually popped out the individual's eyes. And here you see a soldier, he's dropped his sword there, and here's St. Albans just here, and here's his head raising up. And you've got a dove with uh, wings here, uh, taking his soul to heaven. And the, you've got the soldier with his eyes popping out. And the great thing I love about these pilgrim badges is um, you don't have, this the actual soldier is not depicted as a Roman soldier. He, the, the actual um, clothing they wear and the armor they wear are very true to that era. So for instance, Here's um, uh, an, a manuscript where you've got the exact same thing happening. You've got St. Albans just here, the soldier uh, chopping his head off with um, his head there, his dove, presumably taking his soul into heaven. And here you see the soldier much more graphically with his eyes popping out of his head on the on, on stalks. But you notice here the actual armor, armor that's much more typical of the 13th, early 13th century. Whereas the army here is something you'd expect to see of the late 14th century. So it's quite nice. You can actually, um, uh, look at the actual uh, costumes or the actual uh, clothing that are, are worn by some of these individuals. And actually be able to date these, these badges and actually uh, suggest when, what period they're coming from. But again, this individual would have gone on pilgrimage to, uh, uh, to the Shrine of St. Albans uh, and actually purchased this, this badge 
uh, from that shrine. Now, another type of artifact that I'd like to examine um, is our pilgrim ampules. So you go on pilgrimage to a shrine. Uh, again, let's just assume it's uh, the shrine of Thomas Becker, and you buy a pilgrim badge that you can actually wear on your hat or maybe wear on your clothing to actually show that you've been on this, this pilgrimage. But also something else you actually purchase or you could, could, could purchase or an ampullum. And an ampullum is a small vessel, a lead vessel. Uh, they're, only, they're quite small. They're only about five to six centimeters tall. So they're very, very small. And what they are, they're, they're, a circular, they're a circular chamber. And inside this chamber is water. And then you've got the neck here. And this neck will then be folded to actually uh, make sure that the water is actually retained within the vessel. And then two lugs to actually help suspension. And now each of the, and you've gone to your pilgrimage to the shrine, you take, uh, you, you buy your ampullum, and each of these ampullas will be decorated with uh, uh, iconography that particular that saint, particular that shrine. So again, looking at this ampulla, this is a shrine from Thomas, this is an ampulla from the shrine of Thomas Becker. And here, we have the crossbar of the T, we have the arm, the lower part of the T there, and above we have a crown of the, of, uh, above the T. And then on the other side of the ampulla, we have a star, which was something that's become quite significant in the actual legend of Thomas Beck. And here we have it, um, the actual T actually illustrated to actually just help it stand out. Now, as I say, the Shrine of Thomas Beck, was one of the most important shrines in the, in the medieval period and one of the most prominent destinations for actually pilgrimage in that period. But pilgrimage was a very important source of income uh, for, the, for the monastery, for any monastery. So you, as I say, you go, you go to the monastery, you go on your pilgrimage, you, you travel maybe from Gloucester over to Canterbury, or maybe even further afield down to um, uh, uh, the shrine in Spain, the Camino, uh, shrine the Camino. But anyhow, uh, the, the shrines over in France, or even Rome, perhaps. You might even go to Rome uh, and actually buy, buy uh, artifacts from there. But nonetheless, these, uh, when you actually go on uh, your pilgrimage, you buy these artifacts, and these are an important source of income for the actual, uh, for these monasteries. And these, these artifacts, um, they weren't being produced by the monks, they're actually being produced by merchants who are actually being given license to actually produce these, art, these items. And, but they were, they, were great, they were great Swiss as well, because um, you actually, these, these items, they contain water, but they were holy water, so they, they are actually blessed, but you don't have to get a priest to bless them, you don't have to get a bishop to bless them. In fact, what you can do, the person manufacture these, these, these vessels, Fill up water, and then they only need to be within the vicinity of these, these, these shrines. So they can be on the other side of the building, they can be on, on the outside of the building, and then, but they're still be, being classed as being blessed. But also, as I say, pilgrimage was a very, very important source of income. And Glastonbury, uh, they, uh, what they found is that when their uh, pilgrimage, falling off uh, and becoming less popular for the Glastonbury Abbey in the 12th century, all of a sudden they conveniently found the actual tomb of King Arthur and Guinevere uh, actually on the grounds of Glastonbury Abbey. And then all of a sudden, pilgrimage started to pick up again um, as a result of them finding the tomb of King Arthur. So these were really, really important uh, uh, artifacts for the Abbey to actually generate, as I say, to generate in income. Um, but I say that um, uh, the shrine of Thomas Beckett was uh, one of the principal, uh, uh, was the principal shrine of uh, pilgrimage of medieval period. But this started to, to wane towards the end of the medieval period. And the actual Lady of um, the Virgin of Walsingham then uh, took over prominence in the 15th century. And here, by contrast, we see um, this ampulla here. It's, you've got the uh, circular chamber just here with a W on one side for Walsingham, and it's got a crown. And on here, you've got a heart with a uh, crown above. Um, but for the individual, when they're, purchase, they're purchasing the pilgrim badge, perhaps as a, a sign of status, they're, they're purchasing these, these ampullas because they contain holy water. And that is quite significant, the fact that these, these items contain holy water. Because if we, if we examine these two ampullas, we have on the, on, the, on the left side of this ampulla with its neck still complete, Whereas on this side, this ampulla, all of it's got this the neck of it, it's been chopped off. It's literally been cut, cut off. And this is not accidental damage, it's not plow damage, it's not post-deposition damage. This is, this is con, uh, contemporary damage, this, this artifact. And they've actually cut the top of this, art, this artifact off in order to actually access the holy water inside this vessel. Now, why are they doing this? Well, perhaps it's um, the, the individual 
has got some sort of ailment and he, he wants to, some sort of blessing, some sort of a means to actually um, to, to heal himself. And the best way of that period might be to think that of uh, to use holy water. How good water sit, uh, sitting in a lead vessel for 10 years is going to do that person, I don't know, but who knows. Another thing, we do see these artifacts actually deposited on farmers' fields. So again, it could be that they contain holy water, they contain blessed water. But this individual has gone on pilgrimage, pilgrimage to the shrine, and then he's, they've come back, and they've actually uh, come into the fields that they're farming, cut the top of these fields, and sprinkled this holy water into these fields, and actually ordered to bless their crops, bless the fields that they're working on, and also to ensure uh, a decent harvest. So they, they, these are, as well as like being a good source of income, they are very, very significant artifacts to the actual individual who would have actually purchased them and brought them back. Now, this is this was something that was recorded last year, um, uh, that I recorded last year, uh, just south of Bristol. And this is probably one of the best ampulas I've ever seen. It's really, really, um, it's fantastic quality. If you think of the other ones, they're quite, they're quite simple artifacts. They've just got a, a letter on them just to signify that it could be Thomas Becker or um, Walsingham. Whereas these items here, they've got fine detail on both sides. So on this side, you've got a figure standing and he's, he's holding a scallop shell and there's a hand to one side. And this figure here is standing and there's a head still. Uh, there's a head on one side here, a head just there. Um, and you've also got this fine, very fine um, uh, parchment work uh, running around the outside of the, the ampulla. It's held on just by these very small little uh, tabs. Um, so it's, it's very, very delicate, uh, very, very finely cast. Um, now these are, this is from the shrine at Reading, at Reading, uh, uh, um, at Reading Abbey. And what we have on one side, we have um, uh, James, and on the other side, we have Philip, and I'll just come on to that in a moment. But also they have, as I say, one has a scroll and one has a, an ampia. And the trappings of these saints are really, really important because that really signifies who the saint is. And this is one that I always um, I find the easiest to identify whenever I go to a church, a church or something, is John the Baptist. Because he's there, he's usually depicted half naked. He might be, uh, might be wearing a uh, camel hair robe, a very, very coarse, uh, simple robe. And is usually shown with um, dishevelled hair, long dishevelled beard. The simple um, uh, uh, trappings that make him really, really recognisable, really, really um, uh, recognisable. And the same goes for our two examples on our ampia. On one side we have uh, Saint James the Great, and he's uh, seen with his scallop shell, which is uh, his symbol. And Saint James was one of the first disciples of Jesus, and was also the patron saint of. Uh, was also the patron saint. Um, and he's seen here with a hand next to him. So what's the significance of the hand? Well, apparently in, in, Reading, uh, uh, um, in Reading Abbey, uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, saintly relics that they had was the hand of St. James. And then hence the hand of St. James on this side of the ampere. And on the other side, we have uh, an image of Philip the Apostle. Now, Philip the Apostle was usually um, depicted as a beardless um, young man. Not always, but um, often depicted as a beardless young man. And here we see him as a beardless young man. Um, and he's also depicted with a scroll as well. And then just to the side here is a head. And that's because at Reading, they had, they had one of their St. Leo relics was the head of Philip the Apostle. So it's a bit of advertising as well. They're actually sort of showing that they actually, these are the artifacts, uh, the important artifacts that they have at, at these very shrines. Now, another artifact that I want to consider, and one that is not, not obviously recognisable as a lucky charm or even a religious item, is a coin. Now, on the whole, coins are utilitarian artifacts. They, they're a form of currency, obviously. Um, you, you thought you'd use them for um, buying and selling and that. Um, but they can take on other forms of life. Take, for instance, this item here. This, this coin here was used as a lucky charm. And we can see that because this coin here, this is a coin of Elizabeth I. It's a silver coin. They're very, very fine. They're only about as thick as a piece of paper. Um, and so, and, then, and being made of silver, they're easily bendable. And also, they're easily worn as well. 
Now this coin of Elizabeth I, you can see you've got all the detail of the bust there, you can see you've got all the detailing of the inscription. Um, and the same goes for the reverse, you've got the shield here, the dates, and also the detailing for the actual reverse of the coin. Whereas on this coin, if we look here, the actual bust of the queen has actually become very, very, very worn. If it's so worn, the actual, any sort of facial detail has been completely worn away. And all that, we, all that remains is the crown. And the same goes for the reverse. The actual center of the reverse has been worn away. Now with this, you can just imagine someone holding this coin between their forefinger and thumb and actually just rubbing it as, as a piece of like perhaps to invoke you know, the, the charm of the royalty. And I'll come into that in a moment. Um, uh, and just to uh, uh, try to install some luck from that monarch. But significantly with this coin is the outside of the coin, coin is not worn at all. And in fact, if we examine a coin that has actually been in circulation for a long time, a long period of time, this is the exact same type of coin, but you can see the actual reverse of the coin is incredibly worn. In fact, there's no detail remaining whatsoever. And same goes for the obverse, the actual heads of the coin. There's no detailing of the queen whatsoever. And the, also the actual inscription around the outside, significantly, is also worn equally as what's the actual center of the coin is. Whereas on our example up here, our touch piece, um, the actual uh, detail has been completely worn away, whereas the outside has been left pretty much untouched. Now, another way we see that manifesting itself is actually gilding of coins. Again, if we look at this coin here, this is another silver coin of Elizabeth I. But this is a coin that's been gilded. And so they've, covered, they've given us a, a coating of gold, but they haven't done this such create a forgery. They haven't done this to try and pass this off as a gold coin. Instead, what we see is the actual bust of the queen um, is completely un is, is ungilded. So there's no gold on there whatsoever. And also you've got four, two of the uh, squares of the actual coat of arms, again, are ungilded. So they're not trying to pass this off as a fake. They're actually trying to make the actual bust of the monarch stand out. And we do see these worn, these worn coins, especially during the Elizabethan period, but also during the Civil War. We see a lot of um, coins of uh, Charles I that has the bust worn, but the outside of the actual coin itself um, is, is relatively unworn. And then another sort of lucky charm we do see are uh, love tokens. So this is a coin, again, Elizabeth the first, and it's been bent. It's been deliberately bent. Again, this is not plow damage. It's not post-depositional post damage. This is damage. This is something, that something, a modification that someone's done to the coin. And they've actually deliberately put these two folds in them. And it's, you can imagine uh, an individual, a man, uh, giving uh, this coin to his sweetheart. And he'd, as, a, as a sign of devotion, he'd actually bend the coin and actually basically taking it out of circulation, actually giving it, giving it to, to, uh, to his loved one. And here they've actually got a, a, a hole where it's been pierced, but he used a suspension. And then on this coin here, this is again, it's a silver coin, it's been gilded, but we've got the actual denomination mark just there. And this is a coin of James the I. Um, and um, you can see here, you've got the two holes where it would have been maybe sewn onto a garment or maybe onto a belt, held on the belt. But again, we see the actual bust that has been worn. So what is the significance of actually having these, having actual, uh, the bust worn or having, it, having the bust stand out? What's the actual significance of the, uh, the royalty on the coins? Well, quite likely, but what we're seeing is a manifestation of what's something that's called the Royal Touch. Now, the Royal Touch was something that was happened in England and France. Um, Throughout the, medieval, throughout the medieval period and up into the post-medieval period. And really, it's, it's, it's a way of, um, uh, well, it's, it's, uh, it would be the, the king or the queen of the time uh, would be able to touch an individual who's suffering from some sort of ailment and heal them. And it's, it's really, it's, it, it was seen as, as like a God-given right, so as a, a God-given gift for the, uh, that a king or queen had this, this power to do this. And in fact, it's not something that was done regularly by every single monarch. In, so, in fact, some monarchs actually shied away from this practice and actually tried to avoid it. Whereas other monarchs actually took it up with relish and actually um, really embraced this, this tradition. And what we do see is that you'd have a monarch that may be uh, overly pious, well, no, a, a very pious monarch would be, uh, uh, would be uh, more interested in, in this sort of activity. Or even a monarch whose who's claim to the throne was a, bit, was a little bit questionable. 
And what they're trying to do is use this, should demonstrate this power is a God given right that is given to the king. And so therefore um, God actually um, uh, uh, has given the throne to this individual because uh, uh, they've given this power, this healing touch uh, to, to this king or queen. Now, another way we see coins being modified and used as religious tokens are having them folded in half. Now, this is a custom we see in the medieval period, and we have papal records that actually call it the English custom. Um, and what you'd have, you'd have an individual who wants to go on pilgrimage, and they might make a pledge to a saint, and they might go to, uh, say, to uh, make a prayer to Thomas Beckett, for instance, uh, I pledge that I'm going to go on pilgrimage to the shrine of Thomas Beckett, and it has his pledge, or her pledge, uh, would be to seal the pledge, would be to fold his coin in half. They'd then go on that pilgrimage, uh, uh, go on that pilgrimage, and then deposit that coin at that shrine. And we do see these coins at shrines, at Glaston, you know, this examples from Glaston Abbey, and also from Battle Abbey as well. Um, and here we see one of the coins that's actually got a, a hole pierced in it. Um, But also what we do see these coins as, they also, as well as being a pledge to actually go on a, a, a pilgrimage, they're also a prayer to a saint and also to the king. For instance, uh, there's this one example here where a father bent a penny over his daughter's injured foot and made a vow to, uh, to go on a pilgrimage to a shrine in Hereford, bent the coin and then went on, the, uh, pilgr and on this pilgrimage. And all of a sudden his daughter was healed. And there's another one where um, a son who died but was revived after a father bent a penny over the son and made a vow to Simon de Montfort. And then finally, there's an example from London uh, from 1499 where uh, the body of a girl who drowned in the Thames was brought back to life after the father bent a penny over her daughter's forehead and made a vow to Henry the, Henry the Sixth. So, these, these actual, these coins, these bent coins are actually a, a vow to maybe a saint or maybe even to the king or queen at the time um, to actually perhaps to actually go on the pilgrimage or actually perhaps ask for some sort of special favour. And also what we're seeing here, especially with the last example, is we're looking, we're going back to this whole, whole idea of the royal touch, where the actual king and queen um, have the power to actually heal the individual. And it's manifesting itself also actually in the coinage as well. So again, with these touch tokens that we saw earlier on where the actual, uh, the bust was rubbed. It's, it, if you can just imagine the individual rubbing the, the, rubbing the bust of the, this, in, uh, this, this monarch and actually asking for some sort of healing perhaps as we've seen in, in, this, in, the, uh, in the last example. So that's the last one from, uh, for me. So really, if you are finding any, any artifacts, they could be quite significant. And even coins, you know, as, as you're seeing, these, these bent coins, they could have some sort of religious significance that, um, that we might just, you might just not uh, realize or might just not um, uh, think that that could be uh, associated with these, these artifacts. So thank you very much. <laughs>